Thank you very much, President Aliyev, for agreeing to do this interview with Sky News. The French President seems confident that a truce will be agreed in the coming days and that you will be able to resume negotiations. How likely is that and on what terms? It depends on the position of Armenia. Azerbaijan has always been very supportive to negotiation table and, frankly speaking, for 28 years since the OEC Minsk Group was established, we are involved in negotiations. And we had hopes that negotiations, and still have hopes, will lead to progress and will lead to political settlement. But unfortunately, Armenia's position was opposite. They used negotiation only as a pretext in order to make this process endless. In other words, they wanted always to seal the status quo, to keep status quo unchanged, and not to return the territories back, which they have to, according to UN Security Council resolutions and according to the basic principles which are on the table, which were elaborated by the OSC Minsk Group. Therefore, I hope that after this bitter defeat which Armenia is suffering on the battlefield, they will be more reasonable and they will listen to the advices of the mediators and will uh, be sincere on negotiation table and negotiations should lead to political settlement and to the liberation of the occupied territories. But what territories exactly are we talking about? Are we simply talking about Nagorno-Karabakh? Are we talking about the seven occupied Azerbaijani territories that they call their security zone? Because clearly you're not going to get, going to get all of it back. Uh, our territorial integrity is recognized by the whole world. All the countries recognize territorial integrity of Azerbaijan, which includes Nagorno-Karabakh. Armenians' uh, position, actually, it was also a pretext that they were using these uh, seven regions surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh as an excuse to occupy it, saying it's security zone. But today's uh, clash shows that there is no security zone in modern world. Modern uh, military equipment uh, does not provide security even for long uh, distance. The security must be provided by political means. Therefore, we were always saying that political settlement will provide security guarantees for all, for Azerbaijanis, for Armenians, for other nationalities who live in the area. And uh, the basic principles which Armenia rejected to support clearly says how the territories are going to be returned back. In the first stage, five regions of Azerbaijan, which are situated on the southern eastern part of Nagorno-Karabakh, then two regions of Azerbaijan, which are situated between Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia, then Azerbaijanis return to Nagorno-Karabakh. They have been 25% of Azerbaijanis in Nagorno-Karabakh. Their rights also must be uh, provided. And they go back to where they lived in the ancient city of Shusha and other places. And uh, we restore normal communications. We restore, uh, you know, people-to-people -people contacts. And slowly, slowly, I'm sure people will reconcile. That's uh, the plan of the mediators, and we support it. Would you recognize Nagorno-Karabakh's independence if you were allowed to have 25% Azerbaijani repopulation there? No, no, never. And that has never been the issue on negotiation table. Our position was very clear that Azerbaijan will never recognize Nagorno-Karabakh's independence because it's our ancient land. The history of Nagorno-Karabakh is now well known. Second, it is integral part of Azerbaijan, and why should we give independence to a uh, small uh, number of people? Azerbaijan is a multi-ethnic country, as almost all the countries in the world. National minorities live in peace and dignity in Azerbaijan and in many countries in the world. Being national minority does not mean that you have a right for secession, have a right for separatism. Separatism is a big threat to international community and all the countries in the world, they condemn separatism. What has been done against us was separatism of Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh and military aggression of Armenian state against Azerbaijan, which led to the situation which we are facing now, occupation, 
millions of Azerbaijani refugees, ethnic cleansings against Azerbaijanis, destroyed cities and villages. Now when we are liberating uh, our territories, there are videos about uh, what happens there. Everything is destroyed. It's as if, you know, uh, like Stalingrad, it's even worse than Stalingrad after Second World War. But, but that is exactly what you are doing now to the regional cap capital, Stepanakert. That is what you are doing to Shushi, which yesterday was targeted not once but twice, a double hit on the cathedral there, when it was very clear that civilians and journalists were sheltering inside. That was first a provocation from Armenian side. We never did that in the past. We have Armenian church in the center of Baku. You can send someone when you come. Sir, with, with, no, no, no. As just as the Armenians targeted their own cathedral, how can that have been a provocation? That's probably their provocation in order to uh, present us in such a way. But I can tell you that they're shelling our cities. Do you know that we have 31 killed civilians as a result of Armenian bombardment? 170 wounded people and more than 1,000 houses totally demolished or damaged because of Armenian attack on our civilians. And they we use ballistic missiles, ballistic missiles. Sorry? With all due respect, that is also what you are doing with your shells on Nagorno-Karabakh. And you have very sophisticated okay. drone technology, which should allow you to see precisely what you are targeting. So why do civilian structures keep getting hit? No, no, we never attack civilians. What we did in the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh, we attacked the tanks, we attacked the guns, we attacked the uh, uh, artillery systems, and also we attacked the military infrastructure. Uh, it's not our fault that this military infrastructure sometimes is situated in the city center, but we never, on purpose, we never attack civilians. Yes, we have sophisticated weapons, but not all of them are sophisticated. There could be some, uh, you know, mistakes. Therefore, there was never a deliberate attack on civilians uh, on our side. On the contrary, every day, the city of Terter, which is very close to the line of contact, is being bombed. We have 2,000 shells a day on the city. It's almost destroyed. And nobody talks about that. So please, let's be fair about that. We didn't start, and we don't need to attack civilians. We need our territories. Why should we attack civilians with whom we plan to live side by side after the war is over? People of Armenian origin in Nagorno-Karabakh, they're hostages of a criminal regime which is there. They will, I'm sure, live side by side with us in peace and dignity after the war is over. You have said that you would like to see Armenia withdraw its troops. But you have also said that you're not prepared to accept peacekeepers there. How else can you reassure your counterparts, the Armenians, that you would not then retake the whole lands? Uh, if you can tell me when I said that I don't want to see peacekeepers, I will answer you, but I never said that. That's wrong information, I'm sorry. I but never said... You're prepared to accept peacekeepers on that territory. Uh, peacekeepers is one of the elements which is provided in the basic principles for the settlement, which was elaborated by the OEC means group. And there is an item about peacekeepers. But we did not come to this item to discuss it properly because it's premature. Because first, we need to resolve the core issue, the occupation, liberation of territories. And then, when Azerbaijanis will return, then, of course, peacekeepers should come. It is in the framework of agreement. If it is signed by both sides, then both sides will select who these peacekeepers will be. So we are not against it, but we actually were not in active phase of negotiations on this item. It doesn't sound though, as though your terms of negotiations have changed since before this latest uh, vast outbreak of hostilities. So I'm just wondering why weapons should be placed down now if, if negotiations have never succeeded before. You know, negotiations are taking place since 1992. Since that time, there have been zero progress on the ground, zero progress. And Armenia always was using some, you know, manipulation tools in order to disrupt negotiations. 
This year, starting from July, they launched three times a military attack on us. On July, they attacked our civilians and our military positions on the border between Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan, far away from uh, Karabakh region. That lasted for four days. We pushed back. They could not uh, occupy territories, and we stopped because we don't have any military purpose on Armenian side. On August 23rd, they sent a sabotage group to commit a terror act, which was detained, and the head of the group gives evidence. On end of September, they launched the artillery bombardment of our cities and killed immediately innocent people. We had to respond. We had to uh, push back. That's what we did. Therefore, we are in favor of negotiation. I can give you two examples. Armenian Prime Minister last year announces that Karabakh is Armenia. What does it mean? It means the end I of... Asked him, I asked him what he meant. Yeah, what he and meant. He said, that it meant he, he said that it meant that ever since the fourth century, there have been Armenian <laughs> churches, there has been an Armenian population. And there has, ever since the beginning of the Soviet Union, been a much larger Armenian population, ethnic Armenian population in Nagorno-Karabakh than Azerbaijani. You know, he is telling, mildly speaking, not truth. The Armenians' um, settlement in that area started after uh, 18, beginning of 19th century Treaty of Kurekchai which was signed by Ibrahim Khan, Azerbaijani, and Russian general. As a result of that treaty, Karabakh Khanate became part of Russia. And Russia started... So, so, uh, that's how it was. That's how Armenians came to Nagorno-Karabakh. It's only two centuries less. He's telling about you fourth century... You have been in power since the beginning of this century, and yet there has been no progress made on this issue. It is all very well to blame the Armenians, but do you take some personal responsibility for the fact that your soldiers are now dying on the front line because you politically have not been able to resolve this? Our soldiers are dying for our land. Our soldiers are dying on Azerbaijani soil, historical and internationally recognized, on which soil now Armenian soldiers are dying. They are dying now in Fizuli, they are dying in Jabrail, they are dying in other Azerbaijani territories. What they are doing there? You, you should ask Pashinyan what his soldier is doing there. Ninety percent of so-called army of Nagorno-Karabakh consists of Armenian citizens. They are on our land. It's just enough to look at the map. For us, it's a patriotic war. We are defending ourselves. We want to restore our territorial integrity to allow one million refugees to go back. That's what we are doing. And for 28 years, we were patient to believe that negotiations will lead to progress. As a result, we got what we've got now. When we push back and punish the aggressor, you know, we are attacked politically. I accepted the basic principles Pashinyan rejected. I accept the format of negotiations, which is between Armenia and Azerbaijan, Pashinyan says, no, Azerbaijan should negotiate with Nagorno-Karabakh. This is not acceptable, not only by me, this is not acceptable by Minsk group. So he is to blame for what happened now. The French and the Russians say they have intelligence that Syrians from mercenaries are being used on your front lines. Do you categorically deny that? Absolutely, categorically. So far, I haven't been provided with a single document which uh, testified this intelligence. Let them show this intelligence to me. Our intelligence representatives had contacts after these accusations have been made. During this context with their counterpart, no evidence was provided. If there is evidence, why it is not in the newspapers? Why it is not on your channel? Where is this evidence? Show it to me. There is no evidence. We don't need mercenaries. We have 100,000 fighters, well prepared, well trained. We have modern equipment. We have all the necessary military components in order to liberate our land. And that's what we are doing. This is fake news. One final question. What gesture of goodwill could you put on the table to try and restart negotiations at this stage? We already did that. Uh, by the way, I can tell you one more thing about who is uh, against negotiations. Our foreign minister of Azerbaijan and Armenia were invited, even before this outbreak, to Geneva to meet uh, Minsk Group co-chairs. Armenian Foreign Minister was supposed to go in the beginning of October, 
our foreign minister was supposed to go uh, on the 8th of October. So Armenian foreign minister ignored that. He didn't go. Our foreign minister yesterday was in Geneva meeting with the courtiers. And when we received a proposal from Russia to organize a meeting between foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan in Russia, we agreed. So our foreign minister just uh, an hour ago landed in Moscow and he will be meeting with his Russian counterpart. And I don't know what will be the program. Will he meet Armenian minister or not? But he's there. We want peaceful settlement, but settlement. We want solution, not imitation, not another 30 years of blah, blah, blah. Practical steps, timetable, when our people are going back home, what will be the security guarantees for them, and how we will reconcile. Two nations, they must reconcile. We are neighbors. We cannot live in hostility forever. This must be stopped, but stopped on the basis of historical truth and international law. And a question about journalists operating in Nagorno-Karabakh. Your uh, presidential spokesman has said that because they are there illegally on what you consider to be Azerbaijani territory, they are effectively fair game. Is that something that you believe also? Our position is very fair and clear. Nagorno-Karabakh is integral part of Azerbaijan. And our position is that if any foreign uh, citizen, any, not only journalists, if he wants or she wants to visit Nagorno-Karabakh, please let us know. We do not uh, expect some kind of, you know, special, you know, attitude. Just inform us that such and such person wants to visit. And when we have this information, when we have this sign of respect to our territorial integrity, we never object. So those who go there without this, uh, how to say, procedure, they are being put in the blacklist of our foreign ministry, and the entrance for them to Azerbaijan is forbidden. But if, if those people write a letter to our foreign minister that we made a mistake, or next time we will inform you, we remove them from the blacklist. This is fair. That's the only thing we, we need is just respect. Therefore, for those journalists who want to go there and to cover events, please, I'd like to use this opportunity to deliver a message to them. Please inform our foreign ministry by email and, and go there. No problem. And you will not target them? No, we never do it. We never do it. Why should we? We are interested that journalists are coming. I'm every day on TV. Every day I'm giving interviews because we want to deliver our point. We want to deliver our case. We are not aggressors. We are victims. It's Armenia who is aggressor. We want the territories back. That's all. President Aliyev, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you very much.